and mahalo to everyone who is attending live and those watching later. Please remember to enjoy the mele of West Maui by listening to the Na Hoku Hanohano nominated and winning musical albums, Le Na Honoolani Piilani, Songs of West Maui, and Le Na Hono Piilani Na Mele Ho, available on all digital platforms. The accompanying songbook is available from Kamehameha Publishing. The project is a benefit for West Maui's Kayapuni Auxiliary Organization, Naleo Kalele. Thank you and enjoy the talk this evening. Aloha, uh, vili na mai kako, a mahalo ya o ko i ke a koko ana mai. Uh, this series is co-sponsored by HK West Maui Community Fund, the University of Hawaii, uh, Maui College Hawaiian Studies Department, the Kue Petition Hui. The lectures occur monthly. The series features a host of UN established scholars, also innovators, and their research and work on Hawaii and the Hawaiian communities. We proudly present this to you via Zoom and live through HK West Maui's Facebook page. Tonight's presentation, Akua. Dr. Kole Nuuhiva is a CEO of Mauliola Endowment LLC based in Hilo. Her organization provides insights, tools based in Hawaiian epistemologies to amplify knowledge gifted by our ancestors. She's sharing a talk based on a chapter of her dissertation, Akua. Give a virtual round of applause for our uh, tonight's guest speaker. Aloha nui, Dr. Kole Nuuhiva. Mahalo. Aloha. Mahalo Kanani. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, aloha, everybody. So happy to be here with all of you. And um, thank you to um, the folks who put this together so that I could uh, be here and share a little bit of my research. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to start my PowerPoint presentation. And, um, and then hopefully you have something interesting to look at. Um, as if you haven't ever come to any of my um, talks before, I'm a very casual speaker. And um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about a little bit that is found in my um, dissertation that I wrote about. And I don't know why all of a sudden I got really nervous, but that's um, um, what's happening right now. <laughs> so I'm just gonna talk through everything and it'll be all good. Um, but I did want to start with uh, just one pule that um, we do in our Kanai night together. Um, uh, morning sessions and it is a morning pule but I, I will, I'll do it right now because I feel like it sort of applies it talks about what the Akua functions are the different parts of our bodies that are dedicated to Akua and um, all the different you know um, natural elements that are out there um, that also provide us uh, life and things that we can sustain from so I'm just gonna start with that and hopefully that'll make me less nervous and then um, And then we'll I'll launch into my PowerPoint presentation and again, I'm a casual speaker So if you have questions, you have to ask the question exactly when it pops in your head, which means you um, you you uh, type it into the uh, Facebook page chat section and um, Bianca or um, Kanani will um, stay on top of it. And so they, they, they're they tasked to just uh, interject and um, stop me from talking so that they can ask the questions. Okay, so I'll do a pule. Um, and this is called Pule Ho'ola, Na Mauliola Kiakua. And it goes, it goes like this, it goes, um, I hi i paha oe i hi i alo, I kakahi akane, I kalaao ake kau kawali'i, I nui ke aho, A hiki ya mauliola, I ola na mahi na uli. I ola ya mauliola, I hi i paha oe i hi i alo, I ke ahi ahi ne, I kalaao ake kau kawali'i, I nui ke aho, A hiki ya mauliola, I ola na mahi na uli. Iola ya mauliola. All right, gang, that's my pule to get me less nervous and in the mood and in alignment with all of you. And so I'll start my presentation. Hopefully it's not too long. So we have some time to ask questions and things. But again, just please feel free to ask questions right away and um, I'll make sure to answer them. I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay. And then I'm going to start this guy. Okay, so um, 
Again, thank you to the uh, HK West Maui Community Fund uh, who invited me to come here. Uh, Bianca who uh, emailed me and stayed on top of it and asked, uh, asked all the right questions for me to come in and do a talk with you all. She asked me what I would like to speak about and um, and, I, and the sky was the limit. So I was like, oh, I think I'll just talk about Akua, which I've um, actually did this uh, talk before and it is recorded somewhere. And um, this time around though, I just kind of want to um, spend a little more time on it, talking about Akua, Heahaia Mea He Akua. Um, uh, only because maybe in the last five years or so, I've heard a lot of discussion about the word Akua and what it means. And, um, and so part of my dissertation was I wrote about um, Lono Ikamakahiki and you cannot really define who or what Lono Ikamakahiki is without first understanding the idea of what an Akua is. And so um, this is partly uh, part of that chapter that is um, uh, being featured this evening. Okay, so I'll move on to the next thing. Here we go. Oh. Okay. How do I get out of here? Oh my, my technology is not quite following. So hang on, gang. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can you guys see that? I'm not sure. I'm just going to carry on with myself. Okay, so I just want to say mahalo nui HK uh, West Maui Community Fund to the University of Hawaii and the University of Hawaii Maui campus and all the other folks who were mentioned earlier by Kanani. So I just want to say thank you to them because um, the service that you're providing for our community is awesome where um, you feature different talks and points of view and perspectives and things like that. So I just want to say um, Thank you for allowing this talk to happen this evening. I also want to thank Maoliola Endowment, which um, thanks to the contributors who uh, assure that we continue to do things, um, I can continue to do research basically and, and um, be able to provide things for folks as, as things move along. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you ahead of time in case I talk too much and we don't get to the mahalo slide, right? So put them in the front, say mahalo right away. Okay. So a little bit of an audience participation right now. And, um, and unfortunately, I won't be able to see some of the answers, but I wanted to ask right off the bat, what is Akua? What is Akua to you? And if you wanna type that in the chat box, you can go ahead and do that on, um, on Facebook or wherever it is you're tuning in from or on, and you can go ahead and start writing those things. What is Akua? Who is Akua? Is it a what? Is it a he? Is it a she? What is it? What are all those different answers that we might have to that question? You know, what what is it? And um, sometimes we see it with a capital A. You know, sometimes we see it with a lowercase a. And and wh what does that mean? What does that define? How do we understand that term Akua? So um, this is actually one of the things I um. Um, sort of okay looks good thank you <laughs> was asking um, myself um, when it came to thinking about how I was going to describe the function of lono for the makahiki and how does that apply to the lunar calendar and reading time and calculating time and all of those things how does that apply to akua why is there are so many uh, rituals and ceremonies affiliated with keeping time and that kind of thing. So anyway, this is where I started on ground zero in the middle of all of that, trying to figure out what Akua is. And so, um, let's see. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, hopefully. Okay, here we go. Um, and so I'm gonna come back to this slide right here where, where there's movement going on and so um, this is sort of intentional. So when you look at my PowerPoint presentations, um, it's good to, good to look at what the photos are too, because I use photography and I use little video clips and things like that to sort of um, use as a uh, mechanism to help us sort of um, get imagery into our minds and um, and then maybe some memory into our into our being to our core being because um, part of my job oh well 
if if we were back in the Vakahiko time and there was somebody in uh, front uh, of you. Aloha Kale, I just want to call attention to there's a lot of responses to what Akua is. So okay. I, I'm throwing it into the chat, but you just so oh. you know. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, we've got God. Thank you very much. Akua is the, or I'm thinking you. Uh, elemental phenomena, that's great. Power is greater than me or us put together. That's absolutely correct. Ancestors, that's absolutely correct. Higher power, the backbone, whatever gives support. That's awesome. Uh, let's see, Akua to me is all things that bring life, the natural world, the mysterious world. These are all great answers, gang. Uh, gods of nature, ancestral, um, and then somebody said, looks good. Okay, all right, so universal being. Okay, natural forces of nature. All right, this is great. These are all excellent answers. Excellent, excellent, excellent answers. And, and yet, um, when we are, are challenged by people to describe what Akua is, sometimes we have a difficult time doing that. Yeah, we have a difficult time doing that to try and get our, um, our message across as to why maybe a place or a thing might be sacred to us, you know, or uh, why an event or um, is happening in place of trying to protect or protest against something. Um, and so when someone asks you why you're doing that, and the answer might be, oh, because it's sacred, or oh, because there's the Akua there, that sometimes doesn't suffice, yeah, the um, folks who are questioning. And so that's kind of where I find myself a lot of times trying to figure those things out. So um, going back to what I was saying, um, if we were in the Vakahiko time, Vakahiko, long time, long time, long time, and there was somebody standing in front of you talking or, or chanting to you. Um, your job as an audience member is to conjure up, I don't want to say conjure like, you know, negative things, but is to think about what that person who is chanting or talking is actually saying. What are the images that are being conveyed? And then um, for Hawaiians, audience members have to actually participate by including their own thoughts into um, the experience. And so when I start talking about um, this Akua, this idea of Akua, and you hear those terms, um, and you start to hear or see the imagery that I have um, on the screen, it should help to give you some imagery that you want to connect to from an experience you may have had a long time ago, uh, on your own, maybe with your family, maybe collectively with a community or with a halal or something like that, some experience. So, so part of your job this evening is to do that, actively put thought into what I'm saying and, um, and then make this experience that's happening this evening part of your own too as well, okay? And Bianca, are you, uh, are you, are you gonna ask me something? I see the, um, or maybe not. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to start off with definitions of Akua as defined by Hawaiians. And the reason why I'm starting here right now at this very moment is because I find if I don't give everybody the context of what I'm talking about, uh, there's room for people to start saying, well, there's always room for that challenge um, to challenge things. But I just want to say that I'm looking at specifically what Hawaiians said in the Hawaiian language newspapers and elsewhere between the years of 1838 and 1866. Okay, so if I was to, um, oh, there we go, not moves. All right, okay, so that's what I'm looking for. So I wanna go and see what Akua means for all those folks. First thing I do is I go to the Andrews Dictionary because this Andrews Dictionary is one of the older dictionaries that's out there. And so what you see here is the definition of what the word akua means. So, you know, among Hawaiians, okay, formally, name of any supernatural being. So some of the things you all said earlier was actually correct, yeah? Supernatural beings, the object of fear or worship of God. Okay, so with a little g, it says there, that's, that's always good to note. The term of the visit of foreigners was applied to artificial objects, the nature or properties of which Hawaiians did not understand which, um, Okay, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, um, such as the movement of a watch, a compass, 
a self striking of a clock, so that kind of thing, movement. Um, Akua is used for the true God, which is interesting because then it's capital G, um, the deity, the object of love and obedience, as well as fear. So this is what is in the Andrews Dictionary about the definition of Akua. Okay, so for the most part, we, we probably all would agree at um, most of this uh, discussion or most of these uh, descriptions of what Akua is. Um, but I want to go to where it says movement of a watch, a compass, a striking of a clock. So there was something about those mechanical things that were made by man that Hawaiians saw that they recognized and they called it akua. So unlike the way in which it was um, translated and saying that Hawaiians didn't understand these things, they may not have understood the mechanisms of what moved the clock, but what they recognize is the movement of the clock. And so um, this is a definition that comes from um, uh, Auntie Dr. Puolani Kanako Kanahele when she says it's the energy that they're actually recognizing. So if I go back to the same picture of this undulating movement, this would probably be one of the uh, best ways to describe akua is the movement of energy, the recognition of energy. The um, and energy could be also uh, probably translated as mana too as well. So there's something energetic attached to an akua. Okay, so so that's that's one of the first things I want to start off with. So there's there's got to be some sort of movement. There's got to be some sort of um, uh, manipulation of some sort, okay, and um, whether it is a mechanical thing or a process, okay, so we're, we'll be talking about that. I hope everybody's on the same page so far. Okay, all right. Then later on, okay, we have um, descriptions by uh, Pukui and Albert. This comes out in about uh, 1985, 86, around that time in the 80s. And by this time, there's a little more information there. They sort of um, cut back a lot of things, too, that we saw in the Andrews Dictionary. But what we see here is the word akua means god. It means goddess. It means spirit. It means ghost. This introduction um, from a Christian thought of the idea of a devil is now in, inserted here. An image, an idol, a corpse, something that is divine considered divine, supernatural or godly. Okay, so there's all of that. Um, when it's capitalized with a G or capitalized with an A, then it is considered the Christian Aqua or the Christian God, um, which typically in our minds, we sort of think of this fatherly uh, figure, somebody with long flowing, um, you know, robes, might have a beard of some sort, sort of Odin looking, sitting on a cloud somewhere up there in heaven, right? So that's that's sort of the imagery that we are um, um, uh, sort of indoctrinated into because we're heavily influenced by a lot of Christian um, Western thought about that. So um, it's not a negative thing. I'm just saying that that's what um, it is. And if that's who you, um shakalaka to you, go for it. Um shakalaka all the way. Um shakalaka hard, it's all great. So. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm just showing you um, how over time from when it was Andrew's time all the way to Pukui's time, there's been some influence. And um, which is not to say that there wasn't any influence even in the 1830s all the way to the 1860s. Of course, there was already some indoctrination into the new philosophy, into the new religion that was coming. And so some of the things that I had to do was to go and seek how others were describing the term aqua to understand what that is. What is aqua? I don't know. Let's check it out. So in doing some in, in doing more research, because that's what I love to do, um, I, I came across what Keppolino said about aqua. OK, so Keppolino sort of uh, was in that time frame, you know, was there earlier, but, you know, sort of enters into the time frame between 1830s to the 1850s. And so um, Keppelino says, Akua, in his um, writings, he lehu lehu valen na ano o ke yahua olelo. In other words, get choking, get choking different descriptions 
about what Akua is. And, and then he proceeds to describe what all of those are. So for my paper, um, what I did was I looked up all the different meanings that he was talking about, and we're going to go there in a little bit. And then I also looked in the Hawaiian language newspapers around that time frame specifically to see what people were, um, were publishing about what Akua, what Akua was, what Akua were, uh, what were the characteristics, the things that people saw and recognized that would say, oh yeah, that's an Akua. And one of the interesting things I found out right away, as you do that, when you do something like that, is you realize the word Akua actually means way more than what we've come to accept from today. So what usually happens is you have the word Akua, or you have a Hawaiian word, and then you have an English word, and somehow they're supposed to equal in meaning. And um, what I find, that rarely ever happens, right? So it's usually, uh, there's usually Hawaiian words have multiple different meanings. They have multiple different cultural nuances that are connected to them. When they're in a sentence, they'll have a whole different meaning to as well. So, uh, and then you add your own experience to it because we go back to that. So what's your experience about and how do you understand this word and how do you interact with it? Those kinds of things are all considered when interpreting and translating. So it's not really a translation word for word. It's more of an interpretation or a paraphrasing, as even better, as um, Heoli um, uh, says, um, that th that's what we're supposed to be doing, probably is a better word, is the paraphrasing. It's not quite a true translation, but it's more about paraphrasing and trying to get, get the uh, manao across. And uh, so, yeah. Um, anyway, okay, so uh, so that's what this is. Um, Osorio, sorry, the name never come right away. So Heoli, Heoli Osorio is the one who uses the word paraphrasing for, uh, instead of translation. And I really like that because what it does is it shows that every single person who understands Hawaiian language un understands it from their own personal experience. There's, there could be some collectiveness about it where we all had a collective experience and that kind of thing. But as long as we, we try to translate our Hawaiian words, they'll never be the same from all of us. So when someone else translates Hawaiian, we're always going to say, well, yeah, that's kind of what that means. And that's because we also include our own cultural nuances, the perspective of our practices, and also, um, you know, our experience with that actual word or that meaning. So, so you know, that um, is why paraphrasing is probably better than translation. Okay, sorry, got off the subject, but back on. Anyway, so the, according to this, there are ku kapila different translations for the word akua. Okay. And then what happens is kepolino sort of um, separates out all the different meanings into six distinct uh, characteristics about the word akua. Okay, so the first is he hakunui, greater akua. Second is he uhane, which are souls. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, uh, about how the word soul is used for uhane and not how modern people use the word uhane to mean spirit and ghost. Okay, so totally different. So in um, Kepelino's time, the word uhane meant your soul, kind of like the same way in which we use kino wailua, maoli, those, those kinds of terms. Anyway, okay, so three, mana ikaika, ike make, and kumu ole. Okay, so these roughly paraphrase to great feats, extraordinary conditions, and immortal elemental beings. Okay. Four, uh, he, he ali'i, so the supreme chiefs, and so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Five, kupapa'u and lapu, corpses and ghosts, so I'm going to talk about that too as well. And then the sixth is he kawa ha'alele loa, outcast slaves, okay? So these are the categories in which Kepolino translates the word akua into these six different um these six different um, yeah, categories would probably be the best way to put that. Okay, so we're going to start off with he hakunui, greater akua. Okay, so greater akua sort of translates to or maybe interprets into this idea of something that presides over all things in some kind of capacity. 
okay in other words it's in charge the energy or this this entity is in charge of something greater than a kanaka okay greater than a kanaka usually has a nature about itself cannot help what it does it will always do what it does because that's the energy that it exudes and exhibits okay um and so that's the first and so to make sure I knew what those akua were that they were talking about, those primary akua, dove into the Hawaiian language newspapers again and um, looked up an article series called Ho'omana Kahiko, which had about 16 contributing Hawaiian scholars. Um, and so these are all of them. And um, these are all the 16. So some of you might be descendants of some of these folks. Um, I actually know some of the descendants of some of these folks. And so um, these folks contributed to the uh, newspaper called Kanu Pepa Ku Oko'a. They were under the direction of, um, uh, well, under, they were all going to become um, reverends and priests and those kinds of things. Reverends, actually, I think is the right term. But uh, they were in a school to become ministers, basically. And so uh, they, they wrote about all the different ho'omana kahiko, all the different uh, ways in which old folks um, would worship before the influence of the outside world. And so um, so they, they wrote about that. And in them, they actually sort of talked about the different akua that were out there. And I looked at all the different names that they described and how they described all of those names. And it turns out, you know, we're, we're sort of told that there are four main akua and they're usually all male. But when you read these articles, you find that they actually uh, talk often about, well, actually there's like seven of them altogether, but, um, but these are the main five, okay? So they talk about Kane a lot. Well, actually uh, I did this by size. So Lono is the one they talk about the most. Then they talk about Kane, they talk about Kanaloa and Ku, and they also include Haumea. So it's interesting to me how um, we've been sort of shaped and others have also wrote about that there are four major gods, but um, seems to me that when they wrote these articles, they actually talked about these seven main akua and of the seven, um, you know, there's a female in there that's, well, actually there's two females in there that's really important to them. And so um, these are the main ones that they talk about. So these would be considered the primary akua. They have multiple kuleana responsibilities over multiple natural things, okay? Uh, an example of that would be Kane. Kane is the akua of, uh, let's, uh, of the sun, basically the heat, okay? And then there's byproducts of that and he becomes the akua of, of water too as well. They're both male, female, and sometimes a mix of the two, okay? So that's what you see a lot, but generally speaking, you'll have uh, Kane and then you'll have Kanaloa, who is sort of the, op um, the exact opposite or sometimes uh, parallel with Kane. And um, so Kane will be fresh water, Kanaloa will be salt water. Um, Kane will be the northern hemisphere uh, when the sun is in that area. Kanaloa will be the southern hemisphere. So these are older akua that come to Hawaii that are brought with um, the folks who settled here in the Hawaiian islands. And then also we see other akua too as well. We see Lono, the entrance of Lono. We see Ku, and then we see Haumea. And there are all these different other names, byproducts, you might want to say of them, but they all sort of are these main aqua, these main five. Okay, what is it about them um, that makes them he hakunui? Okay, so it's all about that natural phenomena gang. And sometimes we like to, others like to translate the word uh, aqua as elements or elemental beings, and that's cool. You can call it that too, but I like to um, just get to the crux of it all and get to the point that it's really about natural phenomena like um, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, you know, wind, the ocean that you see here, and all of these things create movement, right? So that's, and, and they sort of are just who they are. So if you have an example of, we all need water to survive, but if you have too much water, it'll take your life, right? It's the same thing with the ocean. We, we need the ocean, 
uh, the ocean is good for us, but if we have too much ocean, not good, right? So those kinds of things. And um, so it's a natural phenomena that can either grant or take life. Um, usually has a cycle form. There's usually a season, this idea of season to season, era to era, and then generation to generation. So in other words, they don't die. It's an energy that's always there. They might have a season, but they're, they'll come back around. So I don't know if you guys understand what I'm saying, but anyway, yeah, so that's, they're sort of the primary Akua, primary Akua. Okay, and then another one of the Akua that they mention is, is whoops, is Pele. They also mention Pele uh, quite often, those 16 scholars. And so i um, not saying that she's a primary Akua, but I, I think that idea of um, granting life and taking life in. And, and so she would be the, Pele would be a, a classic example of she cannot help who she is, what she does. She just does what she does, right? She cannot help that she's the magma. So yes, she's creating new land, but she might also be clearing out land too at the same time. Your house might be in the way, but you know it's her nature. She's just gonna carry on. There's no real way of stopping that kind of energy because it needs to happen. We will all benefit from it eventually, which is why it would be considered an Akua. Um, and so anyway, yeah, it's her nature. It's her nature to be that way. It's Kanaloa's nature to be the ocean. It's Kane's nature to be the sun. It's uh, Ku's nature to be um, striking the earth with uh, lightning bolts and that kind of thing. It's, it's Lono's nature to provide oxygen, but too much of any of this, any of those things, not good for us. Too little of all of those things, not good for us. It's really important that we have a good balance of them so that we can continue to live. And, um, and this is how they become the primary Akua um, that we focus ourselves and our religion about. Okay. All right, feel free to ask questions, gang. I'm, I'm just gonna move along. Okay, second, um, second um, uh, category that Kepalino mentions is Uhane, hey Uhane, souls. Okay, just keep track of time. Um, so the essence or a soul of an animate or inanimate object or thing. Okay, that's really important. Doesn't have to be alive. For Kepalino, the word uhane does not mean the same thing as ghosts. So that's really important to note. It really is about your Maoli and um, your Kino Wailua, your soul, your actual essence of you. Okay, so that's what he uhane is. Um, it can be a life force or a condition of any living thing or of that um, uh, or of that of an object. So what I mean by that is energy has to be imbued onto it. Again, it's that idea of energy. And we do this all the time. We do this all the time. For example, uh, Hokulea is a good example where we imbue some sort of energy into it. It takes it has an energy of its own. And so Hokulea is a living being, it has an essence, okay? It would be the same for a ki'i. If I carved a ki'i, um, which is an idol, and I wanna imbue it with some energy. If I imbue it with some energy, then I'm giving it life, and therefore it has its own life force that I recognize. Um, maybe it's your car, maybe it's your house. So these are different things that we do even today, where we give it some sort of this idea of an, um, animate object it's it's animated with energy in it and so we're giving it a life force we're giving it its own conditions we're giving it so um the interesting thing that he talks about though Kepalino says uh, uh, an uhane needs a body or a form to occupy okay so it could be a rock it could be an idol it could be a tree it could be a kuahu but it needs to actually go into something and reside in it okay so that can be called an aqua. And, uh, you know, just to understand that, there's different uh, articles in the Hawaiian language newspapers that talk about ho'omana, um, ki'i, and all the different things that are there. And so um, it's it's sort of this running series that um, this person, SPK Noah Nuhi, also writes about. So I'm not going to get into it too much, but he does describe this idea of imbuing energy onto things and uh, and who has the mana over that, you know, and, and what kind of aqua. Um, 
can reside there or not reside there and who ultimately has such a basically what he says uh just to break it down is it's really the kanaka who has um the the wherewithal to keep it together you know so very different from what the christian world um thinks about things um so we always we always have the ultimate uh mana over the akua is what basically they're saying uh in the form of putting it into a ki or putting it into a log or putting it into something that we um want to imbue energy on yeah i gotta make sure my context is um translated properly okay all right moving along um so Kepalina states that the forms of nature were the hawaiian gods who could occupy anything at their command such as stones clouds streams plants living or non-living creatures okay so uh aqua can be anywhere it can be in the ki can be in a heiau can be in a ocean can be in the in the wave it, it doesn't really matter it's just something that we recognize we recognize that there is a characteristic about that that thing that entity that animate or inanimate object that ha that displays or exhibits um, energy that we recognize as aqua, as a form of an aqua. Okay. All right, moving along. <clears throat> okay, um, the next uh, is uh, mana, ikaika, ike, make, and kumuole. So um, uh, these can be translated or sort of interpreted as great feats extraordinary conditions and immortal beings so some of the things some of you guys listed too as well so we'll, we'll uh, i'll break this down in a little bit sorry okay so typically that mana ikaika uh, ike and all those things that i just mentioned usually are found in in people okay in, in people and so it's usually a combination of mana ikaika and ike okay so um, let me explain that in a little bit um when we use the term mana okay um somebody with a lot of mana a lot of energy a lot of uh, extraordinary um energy would be considered an akua okay and the an example would, would be somebody with a high status someone like an ali'i um, we, we find this, this description about, um, someone with lots of mana in stories such as Maui, Umiali Loa, you know, who their, who their ancestry is, the ways in which they exert their energy on other things, their authority on other things, their people, how they move people, whether they want to go or not go. Mehameha was like that. Kiao mele mele. So there's many, many stories that talk about that idea of these people, um, equating to akua okay so if they can grant mana that means they have mana if they can grant it to others and they and their people that exhibit extraordinary feats strength maybe maybe even wisdom and if they have it at such a very very young age then that person is celebrated as an akua from when they're little because it's recognized that they have some sort of talent some sort of skill some sort of authority that they're already just naturally doing on their own, okay? So that would be one way to explain that. Again, just to remind you all, it is this idea of energy. This energy, who has energy over um, others, who can share that energy with others, who has extraordinary feats, can do all these strengths and those kinds of things, very strong. Um, yeah, so it all comes down to energy again, okay? Second word in that long list of number um, number three was ikaika, okay, strength. And um, we see this in the story of Kaehu Ikimano Pu'uloha, the little shark that did wondrous things. We see it in Punia when he gets rid of all the sharks who killed his father. Uh, Kaulahea when he gets rid of all the Akualapu on Lanai. You know, they overcome challenges through their wit, through their strength and their deep knowledge in ceremony and rituals. Okay, so um, that's, that's why I was saying earlier, it's a combination. So these people, although they were people, they had strength or energy that would equate to an akua and then they would be called akua. So people still point to natural features on the land to credit results from victories of strength made by people like Cavello, Ai Ai, that's the way we say it on Maui, not Ai Ai, but Ai Ai, Ku Apie, and um, Aahuaka. Well, anyways, the people who are from that area in Hamua, 
They say ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Again, it comes down to energy, the energy, life force. All right. Moving on to the next. Um, okay. So um, we we got that all done. We got this all done. Moving along. Okay. Ike. Ike is the next one. Knowledge. We love people who have incredible um, capacity for memorization. People who can remember all the kanawai, all the mo'oku au hao, all the genealogies, the stories, and the chants, and all those things. We just find that as an incredible thing. And anybody who is like that, extraordinary, extraordinarily smart, extraordinarily wise, um, they would be considered akua too as well. In the story of Kamaka, um, Kamaka Nui Ha'ilono, uh, who uses wit and skill to save himself from death and to heal Lono Puha is an example of that. So that this person had um, such extraordinary amounts of skill, they were able to recognize um, someone who was ill and able to heal them too as well. Kaehu Ikimano Pu'uloa, he gets mentioned again. Kamiki and Maka Iole accomplish all of their challenges through a combination of wit, because they're so smart, intelligence, extreme strength, and stubborn fortitude. These are all good things that we look for. And then we say, oh, this child or this person is Akua. So in the stories of Lonopuha and Kamiki, what happens to them is they become the Akua of their practices through their skills. Their skills are so well recognized um, that then eventually they become the Akua of whatever that practice is. Um, and the main primary Akua uh, for, for the practice. So even amongst practices, Akua will vary in different vari um, variations of what people um, look for and um, pray to. All comes down to energy again, gang. So hopefully by the time this is Pau, which is almost coming up to the end here, you'll remember that um, Akua really is about energy. Okay. Now, the next thing after that is, okay, wait, let's get over here. All right. Now, the section there where they were talking about make and kumu ole, make ole and kumu ole. Um, so I'm just going to play these little gifs. So again, it comes down to energy, what's happening in the environment, the process of the phases of the moon, the moon itself, the way that it orbits, all of those things, that energy, that movement of energy, it's, it's condition, it cannot help what it does, it just is what it is. We recognize that as Akua. Uh, storm is good to notice, rain, the ocean. Okay, these are um, all good things that we recognize. They don't really have a body. They don't really um, have, have a thing that they have to occupy. They just are. They are these things that are out there and they are the Akua that provide uh, life through their energy. Okay, moving along to the next one. Um, sometimes we look at processes. Okay, so uh, um, these are things that humans cannot do. We cannot force a seed to germinate. No matter what kind of equipment, we, we might be able to um, adjust the climate around it to make a seed germinate, but we're not actually germinating the seeds itself. It's doing it all on its own. That's part of a growth process. So growth processes, processes that have to do with life, and um, the cycles of life and death and all of those things that happen, reproduction, all of that, that's also considered akua and is something that man, kanaka, cannot do without the assistance of machinery to help us get things to, to be done. So yeah, we can, we can harness electricity, but we still need uh, different kinds of machinery to make that happen, right? Yeah, we can make it rain. We can drop chemical pills up in the sky or whatever and make it rain, but we, we still can't do that on our own. We have to actually uh, fabricate things. So those things that are natural, that, that happen in our environment are considered aqua. Again, it comes down to energy gang. That's what it all is about, energy, energy, energy. Okay, number four, Hale'i, Supreme um, Chiefs. Now, these are the guys who can trace the genealogy back to a primary Akua. So of those five Akua or seven that are mentioned from those guys, there are, there are 400,000 Akua gang. So, I mean, all of those things. Um, if you can trace back your lineage, usually if it goes back to Kane, then um then you have a higher um 
a higher status uh, genealogy. So that's usually the way that that happens. But it can also be to Kanaloa. Your genealogy goes to, um, it could be Haumea, it could be Pele, any one of those. Um, it's your rank amongst others is determined by your genealogy and then therefore you can be called an Akua. Okay. Again, it's about energy too. Now you're exuding energy, you're exhibiting the authority over other people, other things. Um, you're able to, if you're in charge of resource management, people management, that kind of thing in the old days, that energy that you're exuding is considered aqua. Okay, let me just check my time, make sure I'm, I'm good on time. Oh, okay, yeah, I got a few more minutes, okay. All right. Um, the last few, uh, this one is kupapau and lapu. So um, Kepalino says kupapau are corpses, right? And then lapu are ghosts, which are different from how we use the term uhane today, right? So uhane, as I said earlier, is, is all about the essence, but lapu is all about, um, you know, spirits, ghosts, those kinds of things. They're considered akua. So when Kaulahea leaves Maui, he gets banished off of Maui and he goes to Lanai, he is tasked to get rid of the akua lapu that are there, the um, the, the crazy uh, ghosts that are there. He has to get rid of them. Happens to Punia too. Punia has to go to uh, um, Kona on the island of Hawaii and get rid of all the akua lapu. So usually you see the term akua lapu together that tells you uh, so spirits can be considered bad spirits. Well, not really bad spirits, but you know, the guys that are not supposed to be there, those guys, those ghosts. Um, just to make a mention and a note um, that Kepalino and others talk about. So a kino houses your, when you talk about your body um, and, and a living body, your living body houses your uhane, your wailua, or your maoli. Okay, so these are all your living words that we use for living essence. A kupapau is an empty vessel. So um, this is me explaining the difference between a person who has passed, they're no longer a kino anymore. That's not their body, okay, because it's not holding anybody anymore. So it's referred to as a kupapau and not a kino. Okay, that's that's the difference. And, um, and so I just thought I'd uh, let you guys know about that. Now, why is a kupapau considered an akua? It's because it's gone on. It's gone on in, into um, the next the next world, the next realm. And so all that we have left is the empty shell. The last uh, translation, or not translation, but um, description of what an akua is, is he, uh, this number six, which is he kaua ha'alele loa. And a kaua ha'alele loa are, um, they're sort of servants. Um, sometimes they're called slaves, but they're not really slaves, but they are slated to be used in human sacrifices back in the day, okay, back in the old day. And because of that, they're called akua because they're already dedicated to that ritual or that ceremony that will be dedicated to some sort of akua back in the day. Okay, so that's why um, these types of people, there's an actual community of people that were uh, were called kawa, and they're ha'alelelo, they're sort of separated out from, they may be living with people in the community, but they're um, sort of designated to take the place of when a tree is chopped down or a heia is built or that kind of thing. They serve a function in that way. Okay. All right, well, I think um, that's pretty much it of my akua. So when I ask everybody, hea haia mea he akua, I'm wondering now what kinds of answers people will say. And so um, I've come to uh, 6.45 right now, I think, which is now time for you folks to ask any kind of questions. So I'm open to questions and I have to turn the light on because it's dark now in my house. And uh, uh, yeah. So that's pretty much it, gang. So if you have any questions, happy to answer. Um, yeah, so I mean, aole i pau, but that's pretty much, uh, that's what I'll end with and I can go back to things. And if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them and that kind of thing. But anyway, yeah, thank you. Okay, I cannot hear you, Bianca. I, I don't know why, but I see you, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Can you hear uh, me now? 
Yes, I can hear you now. Great. So, Phyllis Kayan asked, Aloha, have you written this in a book or a paper we can read? Uh, Yeah, it's in my dissertation, but uh, yeah, that's where it is right now. And I actually did a report right for um, some folks too recently, and I guess I will publish it eventually, but it's not like available kind of thing right now. But yeah, thank you for asking. But dissertations are on, they're on ProQuest, right? Or Yeah, something? yeah, you can, you can Google me. Mm-hmm. I know that sounds terrible. Yeah, oh, Google me, but that's what, that's how you'll find it. I don't have it <laughs> memorized in my head where it is. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's at the uh, University of Waikato, like Waikato in uh, New Zealand. And um, yeah, I think you can just go there and just um, Google my name or ProQuest my name and it'll pop up. Um, Sherry Galdera asks, I missed Uhane, please brief again if it's okay. Oh, yeah. Short. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a short stint. So basically, Uhane it equals to essence, your life essence, your life force. A lot of times we use the term, uh, we use the phrase, um, we'll say things like Kino Wailua or your Wailua, we'll say Maoli. That kind of, those kinds of terms, um, but actually uhane is is a actual proper term for that too as well. But today, in the modern context, we sort of added this idea of uhane being um, ghosts, and it, you can see where it sort of starts to change. And so, but it's not really a ghost because um, the idea of a life essence means that it has a body to occupy, that it's allowed to occupy a body, whereas a lapu or a ghost is doesn't have a body; it's detached, right? It doesn't. It can't actually occupy anything, so um, that's that's the difference. It, as Capolino describes it in his um, in his book. Thank you. I hope that was uh, quickie enough. Um, uh, Aloha, Kiope Raymond. Um, he asks, uh, "Have you observed perspectives of Catholicism and Capolino's translation?" Oh yeah, yeah. You know something, uh, Kiope. That's really hard to not. Uh, notice and it's especially for myself too I mean I'm indoctrinated in the um, Catholic religion too as I grew up and all of that and I think we all are and um, yeah it's it's sometimes I see parallels that I think to myself gee I wonder if that's a, a a Catholic idea or oh is this a Christian idea or is it actually something that was um, comes from the past so there's really no way to answer that really and um, so one of the nice things that um, we use for our, you know, our research with the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation is we use this practice called Papa Kumakavalu, where you sort of take away all the humanistic things about uh, about what you're reading about. And when you do that, you kind of see the, you see things for their um, natural phenomena, and and it doesn't have the the indoctrinated context that's attached to it. So it doesn't have Buddha in there. It doesn't have, you know, um, Jesus or anybody like that. Not saying that those are bad. I'm just saying that that there that sort of comes out and then you just really see the whirlwind. Oh, okay, that's cool. Or I just see the hurricane. Oh, that's Kane. So you start to learn how to um, see, see the Kinolao of the Akua for the actual phenomena in its aqua form, primary form, that then sort of divorces yourself off of, um, you know, the Catholicism that's, or or whatever kind of religion you might have been, um, you've grown up with kind of thing. But yeah, thanks for asking though. Yeah, it is a struggle. It's truly a struggle. It's something I have to do all the time and remind myself all the time that I have a lens that I cannot help. And, um, and so I have to actually stop myself and then say to myself, okay, is this a real Hawaiian thought um, prior to, um, you know, the introduction of other religions. Uh, And if it isn't, then I need to sort of step back and think about it again. So yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, and you should look back because there's comments that aren't questions that are great comments too. Um, So quick questions is coming through on text. How do practices of EV protection intersect with your research on Akua? You talked about the kupu yeah. pa'u. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does that include Evie or does it? Oh, it does. Yeah, he does have a little blurb in there too, um, which is very interesting to me. Again, it's changed. Um, 
Yeah, uh, we definitely, according to Keppolino, he would say things like, uh, and actually there's other um, scholars who write about it too, like uh, Kamakao um, does that too. He does talk about that. But it's this, usually only certain people were allowed to be with the kupapa'u. When somebody died, only, only certain people would be allowed there. And they're called... Um, well, sometimes it's translated as homia or um, defiled is what the uh, translation might be, but they're considered um, just dedicated. That's a better word, actually. They're dedicated um, to the the care of that kupapa'u, that, that person who's no longer there in the body, which um, gets washed and whatever it is that they do and whatever it is of their, of their uh, cultural practice, that's not a good way to say it. their family practice and their generational practice, whatever that is for them, then that's what happens. And nobody comes to feed them. Nobody comes anywhere near the house. There's there's signs all around little lepa and thing that say that this house is sort of separated out and not to come. And then they take care of all of the arrangements and everything that happens. Kind of, I mean, I think that's what's happening today, right? That there's just a certain small amount of people who are dedicated to take care of the EV. That's all they do. They don't, um, so typically they wouldn't have come out and, and hung out with people in public. Like that's all they're going to do. And then when that job is done, then they go and there's a ritual that they do that releases them from that responsibility and from the kupapau that they were with. When that is all done, then they can enter back into uh, society again. So he talks about that and and makes a point to say that no, no, we don't we don't bring food, we don't we don't cater to those people, we don't go to the house, we don't like that's strictly for those people to do. Um, the only time it would step out differently from that is if it was a chief who died of a very uh, high status. And then there would be, they wouldn't, nobody would be around the body, but the only time that they would be by the body is when they would be moving the body from one place to the next. So I don't know if that's um, something that was added in after, you know, that um, as the influence started to come and they would move the bodies from one place to where they would bury them, if that's where that came from. Um, so it's really hard to say, but anyway, so high status people, um, would go and walk with with the uh, with the body all the way to well with the kupapa'u all the way to to where it was buried. Um, but if you think about it, in old days they actually hid the ev, so you probably wouldn't have followed um, either. So it's it they they get separated out basically. The people who are responsible for the kupapa'u and the care for it only stay there, and that's their job. Everybody else stays away. So it's very different from today, where we bring food and we'll go to the house and we'll hang out and we that that's all modern stuff. Yeah. So um, about prior, prior. fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. Not sure how it changed or when it changed. But um, yeah, that's so thanks for asking. So Poki'i Seto, um, did Kepalino reference in Akua Unihipili? Or is there reference in the new paper? Yeah, that's in the new paper. But you know what? Um, I don't know. He may have. I, I, I cannot remember off the top of my head if he does or if he doesn't. But um, yeah, I noticed that uh, Kamakao talks about that too in um, his articles when he's uh, talking about the different realms of, um, you know, the difference between um, the Awakua, the Aukanaka, the Aukueva. There's like three realms that he talks about. And then and he does use uh, terms like that, Unihipili and things like that. Uh, yeah, right off the top of my head, I cannot say if it does have it. It, it, it may, it may have. I, I know there's a little section of things about that sort of thing. Yeah, and going back to, oh, sorry, not to switch the channel, but going back to Kep, um, Kiope's question about the Christian influence in there, you know, he does talk about the Makahiki, except that he doesn't actually say this is the Makahiki. He just writes it out in the lunar months, tells where things are going, what's happening, but he doesn't say this is the Makahiki. He just, um, so so um, going back to what Poki is talking about, it may be in there just as references, but um, yeah. And if I were to think to myself where that would go, I would say it would, it's probably in that section of the Uhane because it needs to have a body to house it, right? And uni, Unihipili have to have a body 
to sit in and do the bidding of um, of the people who own it. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up in number two um, of the explanation without having looked at that. But that's what my thoughts are, Pookie. Yeah. Uh, Robert Williams, how far back before these um, before 1800s definitions do these specifically Hawaiian concepts of akua go? Like how yeah. old they are? Not very well. They're talking. These people are talking about pre, um, and so they, you know, it's only starting in the 1830s because that's when the newspapers came, and so the influences, you know, um, language came, writing, writing language came um, in the 1820s. So uh, yeah, so they might be talking about things from the past. They, you know, generational knowledge from the past, uh, but it it. It, I know where the question is going. It's really hard to say. It's really hard to say um, whether or not it's influenced. Yeah, so there, there is a lot of influence that happens um, from outsiders at this point because that's how we learned how to write, right? Is from going to, uh, yeah, with be with the missionaries who were teaching people how to write, stuff like that. So yeah, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. I guess it's always the same with history. Like, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, and, and um, then, so aloha aina. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I think this is our last question. Um, but you know, please send more. Um, aloha aina. Uh, Kale, could you um, please repeat what situations or types of events those chosen servants who are chosen to be sacrificed? So I guess in what kind of situations you mentioned? Oh like, yeah, in, yeah. They're the they're not. They don't choose to be that. They're uh, they're born into that um, class. Some of them are born into that class of um, of kawa, and some of them are um, uh, as a result of war, and they lost to to whomever, and so they become kawa. And yeah, so they're sort of dedicated. Um, <clears throat> the best way to to explain it is they're they're dedicated to to those heavy heavy duty rituals that require a human sacrifice. Now, human sacrifices were a big deal. It wasn't like something that happened all the time, every time, every time, right? It would have been something that would have been, so a dedication to a, to a heiau would have been a cause for, for that. Um, or the falling of, a, when you have to fall a 400 year old tree to, to build a canoe. I mean, you know, that's a big deal in the mind of those folks of the past. And so giving, um, a, a reciprocation would be something that would be equal to. So, uh, yeah, that would be the what some of the reasons why they would do stuff like that. Now, do we do that today? No, but we do metaphorical kind of sacrifices where we have to give up time, energy, and that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, um, so yeah, that's there's a, there's a lot of it in instances where you would have a human sacrifice, and it's usually for big things like falling an old tree. Uh, old 400 800 year old tree to build a canoe um, building a huge house be, uh, getting a heiau sanctified you need to sanct you know make it sacred uh, those kinds of things um, so there's not a lot of instances where they would just say, oh well we're just gonna bonk this guy on the head and then you know like for for no reason there'd have to be like a major reason why so yeah so I think this okay actually last question. Okay. So, um, what is Maoli Ola Endowment LLC? What is it? It's oh, it's my business, and um, I I I built it to uh, actually during the pandemic, and I was getting hired to do a lot of things. I didn't really have a business. Money was coming in, so it's, um, short. Long story short, and so um, so I just created this business. I I use it to uh do research. I use it to um to uh. Yeah, be a, a way in which people can hire me to do research and things, and um, uh, so we take the, I take the funding and I do uh, I do some philanthropy work with that and try to um, share the funds uh, with communities and um, yeah things like that. So it's just a small business that I have and it's basically for research purposes. If people uh, need need some research, and that's what I do for a living. So that's yeah, fair. thank you. Oh, that's so awesome. I, yeah, we're so grateful for your research. Um, and thank you so much for contributing your time here. And thank you. Have a good night.
Thank you. This was great. Thank you so much. And mahalo nui to all the sponsors and everybody. And thank you, Bianca, for doing a great job. And Lance and Kanani, very grateful to all of you. And thank you, everybody, who asked questions for being brave. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night.